Good morning. My name is Pastor Stephen Rutherford from St. John's Lutheran Church in Louisville, and I'm very glad that you're tuning in with us today because today is the day of Pentecost, the very birthday of the church, you might say, because this is the day Christ poured out his Holy Spirit upon us to strengthen and kindle our faith and to gather all people into fellowship with himself. And so as members of that fellowship with him, we raise our voices in song and praise with our opening hymn, 497, Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord. Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. 
And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. We continue by singing the introit. Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creations. Please all look to you, to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us.
with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Well, God, on this day, you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our own day, by the same Spirit, to have a right understanding in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for this Pentecost Sunday comes from the book of Numbers, the 11th chapter. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of Acts, the second chapter. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues, as of fire, appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together. And they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native tongue? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. 
the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 7th chapter. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, o Christ. And we who have received the Holy Spirit confess the faith he has worked in our hearts through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue our service with our sermon hymn, Holy Spirit Ever Dwelling, 650. Peace, mercy be to you from God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever wished that something would happen? It didn't right away, but then a long time down the road, almost when you weren't really expecting anything anymore, what you wish for actually happens. Well, that's what happens um, across our readings this morning. Moses was God's chosen prophet. The Spirit of the Lord was on Moses so that Moses would speak the word of God. And that, by the way, is what a prophet is. Um, we sometimes think of prophets as people who tell the future. And sometimes prophets do that. But telling the future isn't actually what makes a prophet's 
or a prophecy. What makes a prophet is that a prophet says what God gives them to say. They speak out the word God puts onto their lips. Sometimes that includes telling um, what God's going to do down the road in the future. But more often, um, it meant that they would spell out God's commands and judgments and promises and really all the things that God wanted the prophets to teach the people for their present day-to-day -day life. And notice, in Moses' case, as is true with all the prophets of the Old Testament, it's the Spirit of the Lord that makes the person into a prophet. The Spirit is the one who puts God's words on the lips of Moses, and of any prophet. But still, even with the Spirit being there, being a prophet, not an easy job. For Moses, it meant he was staring down 600,000 people trying to get God's word in front of them, when almost all of them seemed to have a really nasty habit of griping about everything God had to say. So one day Moses said, it's just too much. It's just too big of a job for me to handle alone. And God listened. He had got Moses bring up 70 elders um, who would, for a while, also be given the Holy Spirit. And because of that, they would also, for a time, prophesy. They would speak God's word right alongside Moses so that the people might hear and listen. And when some people in the uh, camp who really liked Moses saw what was happening, they started to get all nervous about whether Moses was going to still be God's guy or not. And they tried to put a stop to it. And that's where Moses um, let out his own personal wish. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. It was wishful thinking on Moses' part to have literally every single one of God's people um, bear the Spirit and prophesy with God's own word. But then, a thousand some odd years later, when no one's hardly thinking much about Moses' wishful thinking anymore, there's Jesus, who is so much more than a prophet. Jesus is not someone who simply has God's word. He actually is God's word. Well, anyway, Jesus goes and he utters a promise, which is God's promise. And he more or less says that Moses' wish is about to come true. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And if there's any confusion about what Jesus was meaning when he said that, John does us the very big favor of clearing it up. He writes directly that Jesus was saying that once he entered into his glory, once he'd been raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father, then whoever comes to Jesus, whoever looks to him as Lord and Savior, God will put the Holy Spirit on that person. That's the promise. And then Pentecost happens. And what Jesus promised starts happening. Christ pours out his spirit on the apostles. And they turn around and they start prophesying. They start saying God's own words. Now, no doubt there were a lot of remarkable signs that were happening on Pentecost along with the prophesying. There were the speaking in different languages. There were healings and all kinds of things. But the most remarkable thing, the thing that Peter points to as the most remarkable thing, is that they start prophesying. The most important thing that happens on Pentecost, as Peter has it, is that God is fulfilling his promise by pouring out his spirit on all all of his people, on every single one of his people. Whether they're young or old, whether they're men or women, rich, poor, slaves or free, does not matter. From that point on, even down to today, to be one of God's people, to be a Christian, is to have the Holy Spirit poured on you. It's to have God's word put on your heart on your mind and into your lips. Or again, as Jesus says, 
If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. To be a Christian, therefore, is to be someone who bears the Holy Spirit. It is to be a temple of the Spirit of God. If you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus has given the Spirit to you. Um, let me put what I'm saying to you this way about what we're saying here and what that entails. Some of you know that I'm one of those kind of crazy people when it comes to Christmas lights. Um, I would love nothing better every year if the afterglow from my house were visible a good five counties over. Now, I'm a long way off of getting that many lights. It's a process. But regardless, any of you who have ever decorated, you know how light strings work, or for that matter, how they don't work. They have to be plugged into the source. They have to be part of a main electrical circuit. And once a light is plugged into its socket on the circuit, well, quite a number of things happen. First of all, the bulb lights up as the electricity moves through it. And more than that, now the bulb itself becomes a conduit for the electricity. So that the electricity passes through that bulb and the bulb becomes the path the electricity uses to move down the line to the next socket and the next bulb and pass on. What happens on Pentecost and what happens to every single one of God's people is sort of like that. The Holy Spirit is kind of like the electricity that plugs you into Christ and hooks you into God's living and active word so that the spirits and the word start coursing through you. And as soon as it starts coursing through you, it lights you up and it even makes you a conduit through which the same spirit that fills you and makes you part of God's circuit it's passed on down the line to do the same thing to others. So what Jesus is saying in this brief promise in John is, first of all, that he himself is the source. He is the life-giving water, the light of the world, the only way anyone ever gets plugged into God. He's the one who pours out the Spirit. Where Jesus goes, there that the Spirit of God goes. So what Jesus is saying, second of all, is that when you come face to face with him, with the living word of God, you are also being encountered by the Spirit of God. And at once, the Spirit starts working to plug you into Christ. Now, without electricity, it doesn't matter. The bulb will not light out up. Without the Spirit working on you, it does not matter how many times you read the Bible, you won't recognize Christ for what he really is. You won't get anything truly worthwhile out of him because you'll just stay dead as a bulb on a string with no power. But when Christ the Word encounters us, the Spirit is already at work on us there alongside him to hook us into him. To put it the way our forefathers put it, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts. The Spirit is the one who brings me to drink from Christ's life and live. The Spirit leads me to the living water and causes me to drink. The Spirit creates faith in me and casts out the darkness of my mind and fills me with confidence in my Lord. But what Jesus is saying, thirdly, is that once the Spirit brings you to faith and hooks you up to Jesus through the Word, that's just the beginning. Because then you are lit up. No longer a dead bulb, you begin to shine. You start being transformed as the Word fills your heart and your mind so that you start actually wanting the sorts of things God says. That you leave off griping about them. That you stop hating them and ignoring them or working against them. Even though you are a sinner, even though 
there's a certain amount of resistance in any light bulb to the electrical current, you actually do start shining. And so you do tr start trying to listen to the word because you start loving it as though it is the only thing keeping you going. If you're a Christian, then you realize, or when you realize something you're doing is sinful, the natural response is that you start working to put that thing to death. When thoughts or words start cropping up in your heart or uh, on your mind or mouth that you know aren't in line with God's word, you fight it. Sometimes you lose. The resistance is always there in this life. But win or lose, you hate the resistance. You struggle against that sinful resistance. Because now you have the Spirit of God moving you to trust God, to love Him, and to love what He says and does. If you don't love what He says and does, if you don't fight with the resistance against what God says and does, if you don't resist your resistance to God, you're a dead bulb. No spirit, no light, no life. No Christian. After all, as our fathers put it, the Holy Spirit has sanctified me and keeps me in the one true faith. Or again, being washed in the Spirit, as they say, indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. And yet, even this lighting up, this being made holy by the Holy Spirit and striving to do the will of God and contend against our sinfulness, even that isn't the limit of what God does when he puts his spirit on us. Because fourth, as Jesus says, every Christian becomes a conduit of the spirit. Out of us flow streams of living water. The spirit passes through you to electrify others. Moses wish comes true. Jesus promise gets kept. What Peter says happens. All Christians become prophets. Springs of living water gush out of you to give life to everyone who comes and drinks that word that pours from you. Every single Christian, to the extent that they are Christian, not only has the word of God put in their hearts and on their minds, but also onto their lips. You are made a prophet and called to prophesy and speak the word of God to others in whatever place God has put you. You might not start telling the future or healing diseases or speaking in tongues, but you do have the most remarkable thing about Pentecost happening to you and through you. You are given to speak the commands and the promises, the judgments and the mercies of God to people around you. You are given to encourage, to admonish, to rebuke, and you forgive sins of those who offend the Most High and look for mercy. Not with your words, but by the power of the Spirit who lives in you, you do it with the Word of God himself. No, you don't do that as pastors. You're not called publicly to do that on behalf of the entire congregation. But in the places and relationships God has put you, as parents to your children, as sisters to your brothers, as friends to your friends, workers with your co-workers, in all of those contexts, you prophesy. You speak the word. And what happens when you do that. Well, no doubt you meet bulbs with a lot of resistance, but the word of the Lord that he has put on your lips goes down the line. The electricity passes through your lips and into the ears, down through the hearts and up through the minds and out through the mouth of the people it lights up. As you prophesy, the Spirit fills some of those who hear and plugs some of them into Christ. They learn to call on the name of the Lord you speak for. 
and they are saved. And more than that, they pass the Spirit along as prophets of God themselves. Now, it's no easy thing to be a prophet, no doubt. Especially not when you're dealing with people who aren't plugged into Christ and tend to gripe at everything God says. But for one thing, I guess that's why God has called literally every other Christian to share the load and shine alongside you and with you. So that you aren't one lonely little light shining in the darkness. But on the other hand, I guess that's why God put the work in the hands of the Holy Spirit. You're a messenger. The words, they're his. And it's his power that fills them. The Spirit of God can certainly get whatever job he's done, job done that he aims to do. So whether the job of being a prophet is hard or not, there's plenty of call to be confident and to carry on with it. For the Spirit of God is upon you. He is within your heart and within your mind, constantly renewing you to shine with the light of Christ. And he is on your lips, constantly working through you to bring himself into the hearts of others. Go shine and be a fountain of living water. Amen. And we continue our service with our offertory hymn to God, the Holy Spirit, let us pray, 768. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Holy Spirit, Christless Comforter, we thank and praise you that you have poured yourself upon your whole church on earth and upon our own individual hearts. We thank you for the gift of faith by which you unite us to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We praise you for the holiness you work in our hearts that leads us to strive to follow our Father's will. 
in all these things continue to support and uphold us that the evil spirit may have no power over us, and that our lives may be ever more fully conformed to Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, you are the creator of the church, for by your breath we are moved to proclaim the gospel of truth, and by your indwelling we are moved to cling to that truth. Therefore, continue to breathe out upon your church throughout all the world and scattered abroad that we might always proclaim you to the nations, that you might breathe on those still in darkness, that they might come into the living light of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creator Spirit, you uphold all things and move all things according to the Father's good pleasure. We know that you likewise move and oversee even our earthly governments. Therefore, we lift them up before you, asking that you would guide them, that they may carry out the offices in to which they have been entrusted with prudence, justice, and above all, a sense of selflessness that aims for the good of those they serve. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, Holy Spirit, we ask likewise that you would pour your comforts and consolation into the hearts of those who are suffering any kind of affliction or degradation of body, mind, or spirit. Heal them wherever there is a need for healing. If it be your will, return them to the callings that you so richly give them that they may serve you gladly and willingly. In all things, remind them that their true comfort is found in the life in Christ, which you impart. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, you know what to pray when words fail us. You intercede for us with groans too deep for words. Therefore, groan on our behalf all those things that lay upon our hearts and those things which we ought to pray but do not pray for. Hear us. You who reign with our Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father as one God, now and forever. Amen. Trusting in our Lord's promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. conclude our services with our final hymn, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, 699.
Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to pour out his spirit upon all who come to him to drink. So come to him and he will fill you. He will renew whatever is lagging or lacking in your relationship with him as he pours out that water, which will quench your thirst for all time. Go in his peace. Serve him. Mm -hmm.